The main focus of this session is to facilitate a dialogue with you all. And to begin that discussion, we will have contributions from our panelists. Dr. Krauss is the president of the coordinating committee of the Jewish communities in Croatia. The WJC's Croatian affiliate, it's a position that he has held since 1993. Dr. Krauss was born in Zagreb in 1945, and he's been at the forefront of the Croatian Jewish community's fight against efforts to obfuscate the Holocaust and the wartime role of the Ustasha movement in the persecution and murder of Serbs, Jews, and Roma. Dr. Weinbaum uh, is the Director General of WJC Israel and the Executive Director of the Israel Council on Foreign Relations. He is also the Chief Editor of the Israel Journal on Foreign Affairs and has co-authored a book on the Jewish military union in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, Mr. Ernest Herzog, who sits right at the end, uh, is the Executive Director for Operations at the WJC, uh, with a particular interest and expertise on online Holocaust denial. Uh, Mr. Herzog will be assisting Dr. Krauss in his remarks, and I do hope that he'll also be able to field any elements of the discussion that pertain to online Holocaust denial. Perhaps if I might ask Dr. Krauss to begin our discussion with remarks uh, on the community in Croatia, uh, and as I said, Mr. Herzog will kindly assist him. Good morning. Uh, excuse me, my English is very lost. I like to uh, present to you the situation in Croatia. Uh, it's a uh, se uh, very similar situation in Croatia, also in other Eastern Europe uh, country. But it's uh, more specific because uh, Croatia in the time in between uh, 941, 945, exist independent states uh, Croatia. It's puppy uh, states with uh, support uh, of Nazi and uh, Italian fascist. In this time uh, exist uh, specific uh, ra racist law in, in Croatia. Uh, is not uh, to be only Jew, was also Serbs, Roms and enemy of uh, Papi uh, independent states of the Croatia. In this time exist uh, more of uh, 50 uh, concentration camp with uh, extermination is about 15. Uh, the uh, racistic law started with uh, day of uh, uh, independence states with uh, 10 April 1941. And uh, in the same time, it's open uh, concentration camp in uh, in country of the Croatia. That's uh, what I like presented that to you, because that's a specific situation. Because today, uh, with uh, declaration uh, of the European Union for. Uh, uh, 23 August is day of uh, oh, August oh, yeah, the, is the day of the, of the victim, victim of the totalitarianism. totalitarianism no? uh, now it's completely mixed. Uh, totalitarianism after sec after Second War and. Uh, uh, victim of the Ustashe uh, regime. For uh, uh, example, to, to, uh, this year, for this day, 23 August, is, was commemoration in uh, Zagreb and commemorate uh, victim uh, of the uh, victim uh, after Second War in the cemetery when was uh, when was. Ustashe and uh, and uh, uh, German uh, uh, German uh, soldiers, you know? and uh, with that, I I can understand that because it's completely moved uh, it's uh, moved uh, try you know? Eastern, the, the truth. 
truth. And it's also uh, the, it, the other problem is uh, completely uh, il, il, equally the uh, partisan movements and the uh, Ustasha movements and victim of the uh, 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 Ustasha and, uh, and partisans. That is, that is a problem because uh, also it's uh, very, um, it's uh, prescribed the new history of the Second World War. And uh, last year, uh, between a ceremony uh, uh, in uh, Yasenovac, uh, Sedlar, it's uh, one uh, act, uh, not actor, regisseur, no, it's uh, director. Uh, director. He goes out uh, many, many years with many films. It's completely, uh, completely uh, uh, change the history and the uh, historical argument of the Yasenovac with uh, completely uh, uh, and this man it's a uh, great person in Israel this is also a problem uh, for Jewish community and, and me because he also uh, uh, wrote the film for politician in, uh, in Israel that is, for me, the big problem, no? And uh, other, uh, it's uh, in the school, it's the problem because uh, the priest uh, in the school because uh, is, uh, we don't know. Religious education. Uh, uh, religious education, it's uh, uh, go also in, uh, not only religion, go, the priest go also, uh, uh, Go, uh, talk about history, uh, history in the time uh, of the Second War, of the also history of the Idanaras Bridge of the book. They say that, that uh, Christ, even is today, in the uh, murdered was... of the Jew, and that it's. Very uh, and uh, uh, also on the stadion, you you know what is Zadom Spremli. Zadom Spremli is very similar uh, with Zik Hai. No, that is possible. Uh, uh, said that on the stadion without any reaction of the policy or uh, any reaction of the people. Also, uh, one of the the more popular singer is Thompson. I, I don't know if you know. Is one singer. He started uh, in the time of the, uh, this uh, war, 1991. Uh, it's uh, all uh, more popular things start with Zadom Spren, and that is uh, many problem. Also, this singer is uh, very. Uh, uh, it's. Uh, all presidents, uh, Mrs. President is one of the uh, one of the best singer for uh, for, uh, for, her. for her. And every uh, ceremony in our uh, uh, our uh, office, not office, in uh, ceremony for. Public started with song of not this song, but one of the song of the, this Thompson, no? and uh, exist uh, uh, law for that. E exist uh, a, a state court. No? He is uh, constitution. Constitu constitution uh, law. He is uh, really good, but not not any. Uh, uh, results of that because the uh, uh, court and other don't don't work or or uh, or work. No. Thank you. I hope that we'll come on to discussing, including yes. using legal frameworks, um, how best to combat these developing phenomena. Uh, Dr. Weinbaum, might I ask you to address the issue of Holocaust denial and distortion in Eastern Europe? Good morning. Um, we're very fortunate because Dr. Krauss has given us a kind of case study 
of a phenomenon I would like to describe um, that exists to a greater or lesser extent uh, throughout post-communist Europe. And we're referring here, of course, to uh, revisionism, obfuscation, distortion. Uh, we can use any of those words. And I believe today, um, and I think most of my colleagues agree, that this is something that's actually more pernicious than conventional Holocaust denial, which we have seen some years ago, but which is today, for the most part, a rather marginal phenomenon and is largely discredited. Well, first, it's important to describe the space where this is taking place, and that is this vast expanse from the Baltic Sea in the north to the Black Sea in the south, which was once the heartland of European Jewry, and one might even say it was the heartland of world Jewry. This was a sort of beating heart of the Jewish people worldwide. It was home to the largest Jewish communities and Jewish communities which had a great influence uh, beyond that particular area. And it also gave birth to Jewish communities in many other parts of the diaspora as there was a flow of immigrants. But at the same time, during the Second World War, that area was in fact, well, we could call it the epicenter of the Holocaust. And it's important to remember also, and I think we will learn a little bit about that more today, Jews from throughout Europe were brought to this neighborhood uh, to, to meet their death. And that means that there was a much higher degree during the war years, consciousness of what was happening. Because even though Jews were deported from many other parts of Europe, for the most part, and despite whatever indignities to which they were subjected at home, the acts of murder very often took place in this part of the world. Um, obviously, every one of the countries in this neighborhood has its own specific pathology in terms of how do we look at the way society reacted to the destruction of the Jews. We can speak, of course, about bystanders. We can speak also about uh, facilitators, accessories, collaborators. Um, and then we can speak about people who, who uh, participated in, in the rescue of Jews which probably, and to the best of our knowledge, and based on the research that has been done, was probably the smallest segment of the population. Um, when I said a few moments ago that we have to take into account the specific pathology of each country, uh, some of the countries that we're speaking about had collaborationist governments. They were uh, either satellite states of the Germans or they were allied with the Germans. And for example, in the case of Croatia, there were others that were under direct occupation, uh, but the local society or local institutions played some role, and usually not a very savory one, in dealing with, dealing with the German plan to uh, wipe out the Jewish people. So you're talking about people who were, to some extent, uh, eyewitnesses to murder. And there was no real confrontation after the war with that fact. For the most part, these countries very quickly came under communist rule. There was no real attempt to confront the history of what had happened. And obviously, the communist authorities, were, which were struggling to enforce uh, their own regimes and were interested in creating their own narrative consonant with the communist view of history, very shamelessly appropriated the Jewish victims in almost all the countries. And when I say they shamelessly appropriated the victims, I mean Jews, people who had been killed simply because they had been Jews, very quickly were subsumed into the local narrative. So one did not speak about Jews being killed, whether in Poland or in Hungary or in any of the other countries in the neighborhood, but you spoke about local people, Poles, Hungarians, Romanians, Lithuanians. There was no attempt really to make that distinction. Um, and quite, par quite ironically, it was observed once that dead Jews make very good Poles, Hungarians, Lithuanians, Romanians, and so forth. And so this was a situation that persisted for many years, and I would argue to, again, a greater or lesser extent, right up until the collapse of communism. Well, when communism, and to everyone's great surprise, disappeared or fell apart over a very short period, suddenly nations that were not able to determine their own fate were, were sort of cast adrift. Now, in some cases, these were countries that had a long history. 
But in other cases, they were countries that hadn't really any long or even any tradition of independence whatsoever. Or the only time that they really had any, any independence was during the war years, essentially as German satellites. So that created a, a kind of challenge. How could history now be rewritten? What was the message that people were going to receive about what had happened in these countries uh, during the war years? When I speak about this phenomenon, I always recall uh, a quotation from the book Requiem for a Nun um, by William Faulkner, who wrote, the past is never dead. It's not even past. And why do I say that? Because these were countries that were very history conscious. They were also countries which were national states with a dominant ethnic group um, that didn't accept the idea that having a nation state is something anachronistic, just the opposite. And it was very important for them to gather quickly together some facts to present to the population, say, here, this is our history, and this is something that we can be proud of, and this is something that we can uh, rally around. It's important to understand that this is played out in different ways throughout this neighborhood, but there are certain common trends that we can identify that you see in all of them. Well, one of them is the idea that there was a red-brown symmetry. I mean, all of these countries, all the populations had suffered under communist rule, and there was the idea that, well, it's true that the Jews suffered a terrible fate, but our own people also uh, were faced by something similar when we were subjected to communist rule. This is the notion of double genocide. So in fact, and Dr. Krauss alluded to this, let's mark the suffering of all victims of totalitarianism, whether communism or Nazism, and we'll put them all in the same basket, which of course um, is an attempt to draw attention away from the suffering of the Jews, and in particular, the suffering of the Jews that may have been uh, the result of <coughs> local, local accessories or local collaborators. And you see something else in that, and that is there's an attempt to say, well, the sufferings of our people under communism were actually, to a large measure, the work of Jews. Jews were, had a disproportionate role in the creation of communism, and therefore we should, we should uh, remind the Jews that they also played a, 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 very, a, a very ugly role in this time in history. Then you see, have I got a couple of minutes? Uh, one. one minute, oh God, okay, we'll I'm have being, to do this. I'm being kept very tight. No, you have, to be with, you have to be with me, you have to be ruthless. So let me just say a couple of other things. Well, one, one, one <coughs> important point to uh, identify is the glorification of so-called heroes, people who took part in the struggle against communism. These were, these were local fighters. They fought against communism. They may have been members of underground units, but very often uh, they took part in the destruction of the Jewish population, whether as uh, accessories or as prime perpetrators. You see also something, a kind of contextualization. I alluded to that a moment ago, saying, well, the Jews were responsible for this, this, and this. Now it's you have to understand the Holocaust, that this was the reaction of local people. One other thing important to mention, sometimes this is a phenomenon that we see widespread on the grassroots, whether it's in local academia, local media, but it's also something in some specific cases that comes from the top down. In other words, it's the, it's the authorities that are setting the agenda, and you see this uh, manifested in many, in many different ways. And just finally, the last point I want to make, um, and I'm happy to answer your questions if uh, we do have the time, and that is, I would argue, and it's, I, I think it's important for us to recognize that, as much as we would like this situation to change, and as much as we would like to prevail on these societies to come up with an honest confrontation with, with their own history, at the end of the day, this has to be an initiative that comes from inside. In other words, we, we can nurture this process, but at the end of the day, it's really the role of local people, local academics, local scholars, uh, and even the grassroots, or from the top, to institute this change. We cannot do this from outside. The tools we have at our uh, disposal are very limited, and if we work on this too hard, it will produce, and it has produced in some instances, just the opposite effect that we desire. Sorry. Thank you, Dr. Weinbaum. I've been asked to address Holocaust denial, distortion, and obfuscation in, in Western Europe and North America. 
No mean feat in five minutes. So what I propose to do uh, is highlight a couple of issues for further discussion around the problem of the rise of what some have termed soft denial, as this is particularly pertinent to Western Europe and North America. Legislation criminalising Holocaust denial across jurisdictions in uh, Europe sends a clear and strong message. And even in the UK, where Holocaust denial is not illegal, uh, we've had recent successful prosecutions actually initiated by the Jewish community uh, of Alison Chablos and Jeremy Bedford Turner for the crime of incitement to racial hatred. But both have been acknowledged to be Holocaust deniers in the uh, significant press coverage that has covered their prosecutions. Now, while we may still be uh, easily able to call out Holocaust deniers such as David Irvin, Ernest Zundel, Robert Farisong, the uh, phenomenon of soft denial is becoming increasingly pervasive uh, and becoming increasingly common and acceptable. I see some parallels, in fact, with the with the uh, developments in, uh, both uh, in Eastern Europe um, and I imagine also in terms of uh, online uh, Holocaust denial, which uh, will hopefully come on to uh, in the discussion. It's become so acceptable that people increasingly fail even to recognize it when it occurs. Many have identified the problem of uh, anti-Semitism in the UK Labour Party uh, as either generating or echoing a uh, broader shift in public discourse in the UK where soft denial has increased and there is a growing failure to recognize obfuscation, uh, minimization when it occurs. Perhaps I might highlight a, a couple of uh, very recent examples. With respect to the world's oldest national broadcaster with an unparalleled reputation for uh, fairness and objectivity, well, earlier this month, the BBC World Service tweeted to promote a radio programme about the history of language. Uh, it tweeted that the number of Yiddish speakers in the world was severely depleted by the mid-20th century. A passive statement, the BBC World Service did not see fit to include the reason why the number of Yiddish speakers was so severely deplete depleted in this time. There was no mention of the Holocaust. On Thursday night, on prime time on the flagship BBC News at 10, in a segment on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, Orla Guerin, the BBC's international correspondent, saw fit to link the murder of six million Jews in the Holocaust to Israel's conflict with the Palestinians. And the most pervasive area in which this form of soft denial is finding fertile ground is the association of the Holocaust with commentary on the modern state of Israel, the link between Holocaust denial and so-called anti-Zionism. Now, while these examples are from the UK, this is indicative of a trend across Western Europe and North America, which we see manifested in politics, uh, in academia, and on campuses. I hope that we'll come on to addressing methods to combat this phenomenon, and certainly the plight of uh, Jewish students on campus in this context uh, appears to have played a significant role in the uh, recent executive order of President Trump against anti-Semitism. There is an argument that this uh, denial practice shifts, shifts boundaries. Uh, it opens the door to the more traditional hardcore denial. The Holocaust and Holocaust denial is no, so, no longer solely the province of neo-Nazi cranks. There is a relatively new, loosely affiliated movement making inroads by accepting key facts, but manipulating political contexts in order to implicate the Jews, then and now. Now, the week before last, the online media outlet This Now produced a video introducing US students who supported BDS on campus. A female student identifies herself as Jewish, and while railing against Israel, she adds, Anne Frank died from typhus, as opposed to, say, systematic extermination. Now, the video's been removed, but what it did clearly demonstrate is the link between Holocaust denial and anti-Israel vitriol and the canard of Jews as the modern Nazis 
is an increasingly common and disturbingly popular one. Now, the truly interesting psychological phenomenon here is that this movement, while employing soft Holocaust denial, also calls for Jewish boycott, which marked the age-old persecution of the Jewish people, which ultimately led to such genocide. The reason, uh, I believe, that soft denial um, and <coughs> this link to hatred of Israel has the potential to be so dangerous uh, is that it is so pervasive. Time and again, it arises without people perceiving it, which allows it to become increasingly accepted and acceptable.